Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, Celebration Church. Uh, also for those in person, but also for those who are on the, the, uh, the Zoom call. Usually we have about 10 to 15 people. Uh, it's hard to believe it's August already. We're, you know, the summer is, I guess, more than halfway through. It's our first August. And um, yesterday we had a really great time. We had a men's group walk. About 10 of us got together at the uh, Markham uh, Bob Hunter Memorial Park, and we went for a, a great walk, chance of fellowship, and a chance to talk. Uh, we had this discussion about regrets and um, how what we learned from it, and how God changed us if we had any regrets. And uh, it was really a, a great time. And, and, and a lot of us, a lot of regrets that we had in our lives, we talked about actually were turned into something good in the long run. But it took time in our lives. But it was just a wonderful discussion. And, and I hopefully you can join our men's group uh, next time. We do our activities. Uh, I just want to um, also let you know that uh, our speaker today is Dr. Eric Leung, and uh, he'll be uh, speaking, and I'll introduce a little more of him later. Uh, yesterday was, uh, it was really hot. I was actually, we were up north at someone's cottage up in uh, the Barry area, and there's a lot of farms around. It was actually so hot that the, uh, the cows on the farm were giving evaporated milk. That's how hot it was. Uh, all right, sorry. Anyways. Uh, I'm here all week. Anyways, okay, so... Um, the, uh, and just to also let you know, next week the, um, is, is a big week because we're going to have the Matthew Lou barbecue and also the fun day. So, so this is the last Sunday before that. One good thing about the heat is it looks like the grass is all dead, so we don't have to mow it this week. So that's one positive thing. But we're going to have lots of games and lots of fun, and I'll tell you more about that at the end of service. So um, join me now as we... Uh, as we uh, do our, our call to worship. It's a responsive reading. The sacrifice that honors God is a thankful heart. Wait upon the Lord, who is our help and shield. Thank you. And may the Lord bless this reading. Join me now as uh, we pray our prayers of adoration. God of promise and purpose, through Jesus Christ, you have called us to be your people and given us a purpose for our lives each day. We gather and worship today to be renewed, to live out your purpose in the week ahead. We seek your wisdom and guidance to lead us through the choices we face and the challenges that surround us. You are our God, and we offer you our loyalty and praise so the world will see that we belong to you as we follow in the footsteps of Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. I'd like to introduce the uh, praise team. And we have uh, Danny Chow, Dylan, Eric, and Alicia. So we got a, a full ensemble today, so it's really great to have. Thank you very much for all your hard work this week. Welcome, everyone. Yeah, this, this team, is, it's great. I'm, I'm very pleased that um, we have the younger generation in the worship now. Um, and uh, all the way up to my age, which is up there. But <laughs> um, we're going to start off with uh, Who You Say I Am. And the story behind this um, song is it's from John 8, in which... Um, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Jesus says, who the Son sets free is free indeed. So if you're able, please stand as we sing the song. Who am I that the highest king would welcome? I was lost, but he brought me to know his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. Free last. Is great. 
and I'll follow you. Jesus, you're my hope and worship team and uh, the children can uh, go to a Sunday school with your teacher uh, Auntie Judy in the back room if there are any kids I'm not sure <laughs> okay so um, today today's scripture reading is uh, Esther 4 and uh, it, it is a long reading but it is very important and it'll set up uh, uh, Eric's uh, sermon so please join me as we read When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on a sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province to which the edict and order of the king came, there was a great mourning among the Jews, and fasting, weeping, and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes." When Esther's eunuchs and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of a sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs assigned to attend her, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa to show to Esther and explain to her, and he told him to instruct her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Hathak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, all the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you are alone of all the Jews, you are alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent his reply to Mordecai, go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. May the Lord bless this reading. I'd just like to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Eric Leung. He's, uh, he's semi-retired, he used to be a dentist, 
And uh, I know you're thinking, wow, he's way too young, but I'm sure he's not really retired. He's really just looking for the next uh, adventure in his life that God has for him. In the past, he's done extensive mission work in, in Asia, most recently in Myanmar, where he does a medical mission there, and he leads a team. And uh, he's also part of the, uh, the men's group, uh, and he, he joined uh, a couple of years back. And he also has a, a master's in theology from Tyndale College, uh, Tyndale yeah, Tyndale. And he, um, he also uh, is here with his, his wife and daughter, Christina and Alicia. So I hope you get a chance to, uh, to say, to greet them at least uh, after church. So I'd like to introduce Eric, and his sermon will be on Hero and Heroine of Faith, Hope During Times of Hopelessness. So thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, the mic's okay? This one's kind of wobbly, but it's okay? Yeah? Okay. Good. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, it's great to see everyone here uh, as we gather together in one body uh, to worship our Lord and Savior. And if you're online, thank you for joining us as well. It's great to have you online, and uh, you can feel the collective spirit moving all amongst us. Um, I have been here before. I don't, you probably don't remember, but I spoke in February, which is a long, like, long, long time ago. So, but that was on Zoom as well. So you're probably like, uh, I don't recognize you, uh, but it's okay. I have been here. I'm not a stranger. I'm a friend to the congregation. Okay. Um, so back in May, um, my wife and I and, and our dog, we went on a road trip, right? We took a trip, road trip to the east coast of Canada and U.S. Uh, we drove through Quebec and then we went to Maine and then um, New Brunswick and PEI and then we kind of looped back home. Uh, this was our first vacation since the pandemic. So, you know, we took a long time. It took about three weeks or so on our trip. Um, and for myself, I really enjoyed just walking, um, being surrounded by nature. There's just a freshness uh, and, and a vitality. Um, and I, I just really appreciated just God's created world, you know, just walking around in, on these uh, hikes. We saw some beautiful views from mountaintops, and uh, we watched the sunrise, which was so-so that day. But uh, we also watched the sunset. We saw high tide, and we also walked along the same ocean floor when the tide rolled out. And we saw some very weird insects, creatures. And it made, you know, it made you ask, why? Why? Why did God create this? But one of the most difficult things, and I'm not really complaining about it, but one of the most difficult things for my wife and I to do on our trip was um, to find things to eat. Yeah. Um, we just didn't like thinking about it. It was, uh, uh, it, we're not foodies, okay? We don't really like go looking for the, uh, the must-have eat things to, uh, to do. Uh, we're not picky, okay? Um, it's funny. We don't like know if it's really, really, really good food. We just know if it's good, and then we know it's bad. There's no like exceptional, like, oh, this is, you know, I can pick up the notes of this and I can, my palate is so fine-tuned. We're not like that. It's like, yeah, that's good. You know, <laughs> that's about it. So uh, it's all that good food is lost on us. And um, I could have just eaten Twinkies and Big Macs for the whole three weeks, but that's not the, you know, responsible adult thing to do, right? So, um, but, you know, we got through it. God provided good food for us. We did have some Amazing lobster rolls. I don't know. I'm, I'm not much of a lobster fan, but we had lobster rolls quite a bit. Uh, but the biggest blessing was just being away together. Um, and, and with our dog, she really enjoyed going on the road, I think. I think. And now that when we first came home, she's kind of like, okay, I'm ready to go back in the car. Let's, let's go. Let's go. She was kind of sitting at the door waiting for us. But uh, uh, now she's just back to her normal position on the couch. Yeah. But another thing I found very relaxing during our trip was just the lack of, of news, right? Um, not to say that we didn't have internet connection or anything like that. We did, but um, we were just so busy hiking and doing stuff that we didn't have time to, to you know, scroll through all the news and read what's going on in the world. And I, I, said, I didn't really know what was going on. It felt like I was in a safe little bubble. Uh, meanwhile, you know, the rest of the world could be falling apart, but uh, I wouldn't have known. 
For those three weeks, like the saying goes, ignorance is bliss. But the fact of the matter is, things are still happening, right? Um, the world doesn't stop, and life doesn't stop just because you're on a vacation. So after returning back to civilization again, or you know, at least getting back to uh, the more informed world, I just felt like you know, I had a feather on my shoulder for about three weeks, but it started becoming more like a boulder as I was getting more and more news. And um, yeah, I'm the type of person where if everything is going fine and, and well, I feel God is like awesome, right? I feel God is amazing. He's totally in control of this world. And oh, he loves me. He's blessing me. That's great. That's, that's, that's what I want. But when the opposite happens, when things go wrong or don't go my way, or when bad things start happening to, to others, or I just see there's chaos everywhere, then I feel like the world is doomed. There's no hope. God is no longer present. No, he's not in control. And, and I'm asking, where are you, God? What are you doing? This is just bad, bad, bad. I know, completely uh, opposite reactions. And, but this is what goes on in my irrational mind. Yeah, I'm a pretty fun guy to be around. Before we continue, though, Let's uh, stop and have a word of prayer and open our hearts and minds to the word that God brings. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are our God, you are our creator, God. You love us no matter what. And uh, we thank you, Lord, that you've gathered the body here together this morning to worship you, to sing praises to you, uh, but Lord, also to be encouraged by your word. And Lord, this morning, may you uh, speak through me, um, your humble servant, even though I'm... Um, poor in speech, but Lord, may your message still uh, be, be heard by your people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So this story of Esther is probably a very familiar one to you guys. I'm sure you've heard maybe countless sermons or Sunday school uh, lessons about Esther and her courage. Indeed, she was an extremely brave woman. But I want us to also take a look at some of the other characters in the story and see how different people played a role in God's narrative. So as you read through the book, you'll notice that God's voice is not really not present, nor is God explicitly mentioned. If you did a speed read, the book of Esther reads like a really good drama plot. There are good guys, there's bad guys, there are supporting characters, there's a backstory, there's a plot twist, there's irony, there's a you know, crescendo to the climax, and then you have a cathartic moment and a nice happy ending, because good triumphs over evil. If you didn't know that Esther was a book in the Bible, you would think, oh, this would make a pretty good drama on Netflix. If you took a bird's eye view, all these characters, though, they're just ordinary people living out their ordinary life. This is life. This is life to them. This wasn't a story like where David was, you know, slinging a stone and killing a huge giant Goliath. This wasn't Elijah challenging the, the followers of Baal to a death match. This wasn't Abraham taking his son up the hill for a sacrifice. This wasn't Moses talking to God on Mount Sinai or accepting the tablets or Moses leading the Israelites out of Egypt. This wasn't Noah being told to build this incredible boat and, and, and to survive this flood that was coming. Nor was this Daniel surviving in a lion's den. There was no appearance of heavenly creatures, no voices from heaven, no massive infestation of insects, no bodies of water splitting in half, no fire, no smoke, no thunder, no lightning, no earthquakes. There wasn't even a whisper. You would be justified in asking, why is this book in the Bible? Was God even present? If this story lacked miracles, what the story doesn't lack are people of faith that made decisions about life with the best information that they had at that time and with an absolute trust in God's sovereignty. That's the reason why this story is so relevant and so impactful for us today. Isn't this just a mirror of our own everyday lives? Now, I've heard countless prayers, and I've prayed countless times, asking for God's guidance in making decisions. You know, you've heard like, oh God, what, sh you know, what school should I go to? Should I take this job? Should I date this guy? Should I date this girl? What, you know, stuff like that. And none of us see the future. And all of us wonder if the choices we made, were they the right ones? Sometimes we look back and say, oh, that was the best choice I ever made. Or, oh, I'm just glad that worked out. Or sometimes you're like, oh, what was I thinking? 
Now, sometimes you're like, oh, that was bad. I shouldn't have done that. On some days, we just have to wonder, dear God, where are you? I prayed and I prayed, but I don't hear you. How can I have faith when I don't even know if you hear me? Have you been there? Have you had those moments? I think if we're honest and open about our relationship with God, we have to admit that there are times that we wonder if God is present, if God is working, if God hears, if God cares, if God has a plan for any of us through all this craziness that's going on. So this message is, not a, this message is a message not just for you to hear, but it is also a message for me to remind myself as well. Just because I'm up here speaking to you doesn't mean that I have it all figured out. And, just, and somehow, you know, pastors or preachers, they're, they're, they're immune to the struggles. We struggle just like everyone else. However, let's remember that at the end of the day, God does speak. God does act. And there's hope in this world for everyone as long as we remind ourselves of God's character and his promises. So enough of me rambling on. This is the build-up, right? This is the ramp-up to the, to the main points here. So let's jump back and let's jump into our story about Esther and Mordecai. So in the first chapter, you know, we read about King Xerxes of Persia. So he's throwing this huge 180-day bash uh, for all his top officials. We don't know why he was doing this. You know, maybe he, you know, is uh, he's celebrating his third year of reign. Maybe he just conquered some new land. Uh, maybe he just, you know, he could. Maybe because he could. So anyways, he was having this big party. And uh, during this party, you know, He's feeling pretty good, you know, he's got like, he's probably all drunk. Um, and uh, he comes up with this idea. He wants to call out his queen and say, oh, you know, Queen, uh, queen Vashti, why don't you come out and uh, show yourself to my, um, to, my, to my entourage, I don't know, to my people, you know. I, I want them to see my trophy wife. Um, so, but she surprises him or disappoints him or both. And she refuses. She says, no, I'm not coming. And, um, well, then all the, all the guys, all the court officials and him, they're all like, what? What? You can't let her do that to you. You can't let her do that. She just rejected you. You have to do something. What if my wife does the same thing to me at home? You can't have that. So they put a, all their collective brain power together, and they hatch up this decision. Yeah, she's fired. Let's get rid of her, all right? This, she's no longer Queen Vashti. So a little bit down the road, so that's end of chapter one, all right? So a little bit down the road, you know, King Xerxes is sitting on his throne, you know, and he's looking over, and he's like, oh, there's no one there. There's no one there. He's like, oh, yeah, right, Queen Vashti, I got rid of her. So I need to find myself a new wife. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he calls his people together once again, his uh, most trusted advisors, and they come up with this great groundbreaking idea. They're going to come up with the bachelor, the bachelor, B.C., Bachelor B.C., so that he could pick a new queen from all the ladies of the land. So in the end, he chose this beautiful orphaned and displaced Jewish woman named Esther, who was raised by her older cousin Mordecai. Now the story goes that out of all the girls in uh, this edition of The Bachelor B.C., Esther's charm, her personality, and her natural beauty were, were enough to win the favor of her handlers, and also enough to win the heart of our dear King Xerxes. So she didn't need to scheme. She didn't need to, you know, plot all this evil stuff. She didn't have to show off her juggling skills to catch the king's eye. Her road to the rose was silky and smooth. But through all this, Mordecai instructed her to keep her Jewish background silent. We don't know why he told her to do this, but it will play a big role down the road. So, okay, so we met King Xerxes. We met now we met Queen Esther. Now let's go to her older cousin, Mordecai. Okay, so you met these two, and we're going to meet Mordecai. So the story continues. So Mordecai was sitting at the gate, king's gate one day, and he's just minding his own business, when he overheard uh, an assassination plot by two of the guards. So they wanted to knock off King Xerxes, okay? So even though Mordecai is not Persian, um, he showed his loyalty to the king. So he tells Queen Esther, oh, I heard this, you know, these guys, they're not too happy with the king, and they want to, you know, knock him off. So Queen Esther tells the king this, and the king checks it out, and yeah, indeed, the story checks out. 
So, you know, the king, you know, arrests those two guys or, you know, beheads them, whatever kings like to do. Um, and uh, this act by, king, by Mordecai, yeah, it gets recorded in the king's record books, right? Uh, just in case, you know, just in case the king wants to uh, read those record books later on because he has insomnia. Maybe, maybe that's why he wrote it in the record books. But anyways, crisis was averted. Mordecai, he's a hero, so he gets a one-up credit. So then roughly another five years will pass, okay? Another five years will pass, and then we meet this another guy, all right? Another guy named, whoops, sorry, I'm going the wrong direction. Haman, all right, we meet Haman. So I guess he was some hotshot up-and-comer uh, in King Xerxes' royal court, because all we know about him is that he got promoted to second in command, and everyone in the whole kingdom had to bow down to this guy. And everyone did, except for Mordecai. So we can assume that Mordecai is not willing to bow to Haman because, you know, as a Jew, he, sh he can't. He shouldn't bow down to any other person or, or, or idol or anything. He shouldn't bow down to anyone except for Yahweh. So naturally, this got under the skin of Haman, and he threw a big-time hissy fit. So when he found out that he, Mordecai was Jewish, he not only wanted to kill Mordecai, but he wanted to annihilate the entire Jewish population throughout the whole Persian kingdom. Now, I don't understand how one man's rage can, can get this out of control to want to kill, to, I mean, to, to, have, to do genocide, commit genocide. But, but this was reality at the time. So after Haman convinced the king to sign this edict for genocide, on the 13th day of the 12th month, that would be the day that the Jews would meet the sword. And this brings me to the next point. The next point. The world, the world is messy. The world is messy. Uh, chapter 3, verse 15 says, The couriers went out, spurred on by the king's command, and the edict was issued in the citadel of Susa. The king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was bewildered bewildered. The text says the people will be bewildered. They were confused, befuddled, baffled, bemused, confounded, perplexed. And you know why? Because this is so messed up. At the flick of an eye, a flick of a switch, the blink of an eye, neighbor would turn against neighbor, friends into enemies, love into hate, peace into chaos, because the king trusted a man filled with pride and hate. I'm sure that more than one person was asking, what in the world? Why did, where did this come from? How? Why? Have you ever come across situations or circumstances in your own life where you have asked those same questions? All of a sudden, your world gets turned upside down, or the world just doesn't make sense anymore. We live in such a world right now. Why are there wars? Why are there senseless killings? Why did COVID happen? Why did the baby have cancer at birth? Why was she kidnapped and raped? Why did the whole family die in a house fire? Why did that car accident happen? Why did I lose my job? Why do I suffer from depression? Why did she have that miscarriage? I can go on and on and on. It is hard to find an answer to these questions, but this is life. Sometimes life feels like riding the crest of one wave until we meet the, until the depression of the next one. And we ask, why? Why, God? Where are you, God? Sometimes, and maybe a lot of times, things don't make sense. Sometimes things seem like they are just haphazard, random events, all thrown together to make up what we call life. And this makes us wonder, hey God, what's your plan in all this? You do have a plan, right? As we continue to dive deeper into the story of Esther and Mordecai, we will find the answer. And thank you to David for giving us that dramatic reading of chapter 4. But I hope that you could tell that the suspense was building, is intensifying as he read on. There was great distress amongst the Jews throughout the kingdom. And all of them tore their clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and wailed and cried. This outward sign of uh, mourning and wailing was they, pro they wanted to protest they wanted to tell God that they weren't happy with this. This is something that had to be done. And they did this in times of distress. This is what Jews, uh, Jewish people did. But the funny thing here is that Queen Esther had no idea what was going outside of her, of her palace walls. 
First, she didn't know her cousin was mourning or even why. Secondly, she didn't know that there was an edict against her own people that her husband had signed into effect. Her life inside the palace was pretty isolated, which was nice for her, but not so good for anyone outside of her bubble. And sometimes our lives can look a lot like Esther's if we choose it. We can choose to live inside a gated community. We can choose to live on an island. We can choose not to be aware of society or the needs of others. Yes, these are all things within our power to choose. But is that what God has planned for us? Has he planned for us to sit idly by, waiting for someone else to do something? Imagine this is a caricature of our Christian life. You know, we accept Christ as our Savior, and that's, that's awesome because now we have that personal reconciled relationship with God. After that, we just want to live the most safe and comfortable life there is. We don't take any risks for God. We don't do anything extraordinary. We try to stay within the boundaries, and we don't take chances. Is this the path that Esther and Mordecai are going to take? Well, let's keep digging. So after Esther receives uh, the news about Mordecai and his edict, she was heartbroken, heartbroken to see her cousin like this. But Mordecai would not sit idly by, just waiting to die. So he instructed Esther to go to the king and beg for mercy and revoked the edict. Obviously, this is not an easy task to do. There are rules and laws that even the queen must follow. And if the king didn't call you to see him, you could lose your life if he wasn't too happy to see you that day. He might welcome you, but if he's in a bad mood or something, he'd be off with your head. So Esther's exact words to Mordecai were, but 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. In other words, the king hasn't really wanted to see me in a while, so it's not looking too good for me right now. So I can understand Esther's response. It's a life and death decision. Let's assume she has never had to make such a decision like this before. This is definitely like jumping off the deep end with a little rubber ducky preserver. If you played it safe your whole life, and then you suddenly got asked to risk your life, I can understand that this was a decision you would rather not have to make. But Mordecai pushed back, and he said, Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will rise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Mordecai's response was amazing for a few reasons. First, verse 14 demonstrated his faith in God's providence. It says, For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. So even though he was faced with impending death, he had trust that God would save him. Sure, he wailed and mourned and cried, but he did not despair. Through all the darkness and impossible odds, Mordecai had faith that God would meet him and come to his rescue. Even if Esther was not going to help, it didn't matter to him. God will raise up another, or God will provide another way out. That brings us to the second key point. So have faith in God's sovereignty. God is in control. Have faith in God's sovereignty. God is in control. But sometimes this is hard to see. Sometimes it's hard to believe it's truly, it's true, especially uh, if we are too focused on our own issues and we don't allow ourselves to kind of zoom out, pan out a little bit and see the bigger picture or the longer timeline. Our lives and our situations are only a snapshot of eternity. Not that we don't matter to God, we definitely do, but God's sovereignty is worked out over a long, long time. And being finite and too focused causes us to be nearsighted. So when we allow ourselves to zoom out, we pull ourselves out, then we can see how God can use and will use a bunch of seemingly random events to display his sovereignty. So let's pick up the story back in chapter 5. The scene opens with Queen Esther. She's, you know, dressed up in all her royal robes, and she's standing at the entrance to the inner court. And it just so happens, you know, that King Xerxes was sitting on his throne, And, uh, you know, he's thinking about how they got the caramel inside the caramel bar. All right. Yeah. 
I think older people might get it. Younger people are like, what? What's the caramel bar? But anyways, <laughs> so he spots her out of the corner of his eye. And wouldn't you know it? He extends his golden scepter to her, to her and invites her in. So after Queen Esther let out a huge sigh of relief, like, okay, he didn't kill me, uh, she proceeds into the hall and touches the scepter. So, you know, the king's pretty happy that, yeah, I got this caramel bar thing all figured out. So he says to his queen, so, honey bunch, what brings you around? Just tell your man and I'll, I'll make it happen. To this, Queen Esther replied, just, just bring you and your, your, your homeboy Haman to my place for a special banquet. Just the two of you. I'm going to prepare a special meal just for you two. So they go. After they arrive, she wines and dines both of them. And, you know, men are kind of dense this way. Right? You give them food, you give them drink, and all of a sudden they're like, hey, yeah, yeah, I'll do that. I'm great, I'm great, I'll do anything for you. But her plan is not finished here. She keeps them hooked. She keeps them guessing. She says, come back tomorrow. I'll tell you tomorrow what I want. So meanwhile, through all of this, Haman's feeling pretty good about himself, right? After all, he just took, um, took part in an exclusive shindig with, with the king and the queen of Persia, right? Like, who else? But life has a funny way of evening things out. So that night after the banquet, you know, King Xerxes, maybe he's had a hangover, I don't know. But, you know, he had some insomnia that night. Remember? Insomnia. Um, so what better way to put yourself to sleep than to read from a history book, you know? It kind of works today, too. What better way to put you to sleep than to bring out a textbook? But uh, something interesting happened during the reading. Remember how I said Mordecai, you know, uncovered this assassination attempt? back in chapter two, it turned, and it turns out he never got rewarded for his good deed. Uh, so the king decided that something must be done. Something's gotta be done for my, for my guy Mordecai. So he brings Haman in and asks him, so hey, yo buddy, what should we do for this, for the man the king delights to honor? You know, how are we gonna you know, pump him up, right? Haman thinking that the king was about to bestow more honor on him, he says, he says so bring this is Haman speaking. He goes, bring a royal robe the king has worn, and a horse the king has ridden, one with a royal crest placed on its head. Then let the robe and horse be entrusted to the one uh, of the king's most noble princes. Let them robe me, I mean, robe the man the king delights to honor, and lead me, I mean him, on the horse through the city streets, proclaiming before me him, 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 this is what is done for the man the God delights to honor, uh, the king delights to honor. This is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. But in a strange twist of irony, the king commanded Haman to do all that he suggested, but not for Haman, but of course for Mordecai, the man that Haman hates the most. So he must now dress him up in robes that, you know, not even Haman got to wear and lead the royal horse around the town, and like a town crier, announce that Mordecai is the man the king has chosen to honor. I can only imagine the rage that was building up inside of Haman. And, you know, between shouting out praises about Mordecai, he must have been breathing fire. So when Haman returned home that night, he tells his wife and, you know, his, his buddies about the humiliation that he had to suffer. And right away, his wife and, and buddies were like, um, don't know how to break this to you, man, but uh, yeah, you're, 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 you're dead. You're dead. We don't, we don't know you, okay? You, you just go. I can imagine Haman's reaction to something like this, right? He goes like, wait, what? Back in chapter 5, it was you guys that told me to build this 75-foot pole to impale Mordecai. And now, only one chapter later, in chapter 6, you're turning your back on me? His buddies look at each other and go, I don't know, man. You should have thought this out better. Hmm. And just like that, the king's men come to take Haman away to banquet number two. It was nice knowing you, Haman. So at the follow-up banquet in chapter seven, King Xerxes asked Queen Esther one more time what her request, what her request is. And now that she knew that she had the king's favor, she told him about Haman's plot to destroy the Jewish people. Of course, the king went into this fit of rage and he stormed out of the room. But Haman, sensing that this was all going sideways, he stayed behind to, you know, plead and beg for his life, you know, beg the queen. 
say something, Queen Esther. I didn't mean it. I'm sorry. So you can imagine that he was on his hands and knees groveling in front of Queen Esther. He was probably tugging at her robes or, you know, trying to grab her hand or something like that. Um, But somehow he lost his balance and he fell on top of her. And that's the exact moment, the exact same moment when King Xerxes walks back into the room and he sees Haman on top of his woman. And he's like, what? You're trying to get with my woman in my own house? So that was it. The guards dragged Haman away and see you later. And uh, it's another funny thing happens when they're dragging Haman away. One of the king's eunuchs says to the king, oh, by the way, uh, FYI, Haman built this really tall pole at his house to impale Mordecai. You know, the guy who actually did something to help you out? Yeah, yeah, he wanted to put him on it. And of course, you know how this ended for Haman. You know, Haman on a stick. So in the end, because the king couldn't abolish the first edict that he wrote, he had to write a new edict that allowed the Jews to defend themselves against anyone, anyone that attacked them. And it says at the end of chapter 8 that many people became Jews because they were so afraid of their power. But this is not the entire story. You, know, you can read the rest of the story at your leisure. So it all kind of worked out for Mordecai and Esther in the story because they trusted in God's sovereignty. In my short summary of the story, a lot of things happened uh, that affected the outcome. You know, Queen Vashti was deposed. Esther won the favor of her handlers, who helped her catch the eye of King Xerxes, resulting in her becoming the new queen. So when she won the beauty pageant, no one knew she was Jewish. Mordecai, while minding his own business, just so happened to overhear an assassination plot, and for some reason, he never got rewarded at that time for his act of loyal service. Then Haman came along with his evil plan, but his pride blinded him, causing him to listen to some very bad advice. When Esther took a brave step of faith to visit the king without being summoned, she found King Xerxes was more than welcoming. He was in a downright jovial mood and was willing to give her anything she wanted. So after the banquet, it just so happened that the king couldn't sleep and he asked for a reading from the Book of Records. And for some reason, that page opened at Mordecai's heroic deed. And when Haman was at the height of his pridefulness, he was too consumed by anger to see the trap that he was falling into. So all of these events, taken one at a time, they seemed disconnected. But they're all things that worked out favorably. Was this all coincidence? Was it luck? When there is a one-off event, I think... I. I might attribute that to coincidence. But when there's a whole series of events that somehow fall into place, that is not coincidence anymore. I know that in the story, we can see how all of these events lead up to the conclusion. But in our own lives, maybe we can't see what the conclusion will be. We ask ourselves, what is God's plan for my life? What road is he leading me on? Am I taking the right path? Did I make a wrong choice? Those are questions that I ask myself all the time. But this story of Esther reminds me to trust that God has a plan to prosper me, not to harm me. You know, I might struggle with each and every decision, but in the end, the decision I made was in God's plan all along. I just need to remind myself to keep on walking, keep on looking forward. You know, look back every now and then and remind myself, reaffirm to myself that God's fingerprints were still all over me, but then continue going. God is in control no matter how blind I am. And no matter how chaotic and messy the world is, he will, um, he has, God is real. God is real. So the last part I want to talk about is take action. Take action. There are two verses that I have sort of ingrained in my heart. The first one is what Mordecai says to Esther. And who, and he says this, and who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. And the second one is Esther's reply to Mordecai, go gather all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king even though it is against the law, 
and if I perish, I perish. I purposely left this uh, to the last, as I hope it can be a challenge for all of us. When we are faced with a choice or choices that we know in our heart of hearts will have an impact on the kingdom, but it involves a disruption to our usual routine or lifestyle, what are we going to do? I hope that we will follow this chain of action. First, point the finger at ourselves. Who, this is what Mordecai says. Who knows, maybe God put us here just in time, just for this reason. Who knows, maybe God put us here just in time, just for this reason. I know that sometimes we look around at everyone else, and we look around at everyone else except for ourselves. We come up with excuses like, I'm too busy. I'm not good at that. Uh, I don't know how to help. Um, so-and-so is better than me. Oh, that's the pastor's job. That's the deacon's job. I want all of us to just stop, maybe for a millisecond, and let Mordecai's words float into your mind. Who knows that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this? I'm just going to change a few words here. Maybe you don't see yourself as a king or queen or royalty. Who knows but that God called you his child for such a time as this? Who knows but that God called you his child for such a time as this? Second, let's follow Esther's example and commit to prayer and fasting. Do it yourself and ask those in your inner circle to pray and fast for you as well. We need to seek clear discernment from God or ask for God to go before us. We don't know if God spoke to Esther or Mordecai when they prayed, but he sure opened doors and he made the path straighter for them. Sometimes we act without praying and sometimes we pray without acting. But let's make that conscious change to pray and act together. Oops, sorry. Last one, give it all to God for God. When Esther said these words, they could have been her last words to Mordecai. She said, if I perish, I perish. These are brave and courageous words, but I think she was, conf she was confident that she would not meet her end there. I think Mordecai's faith in God, which she demonstrated to her throughout her whole life, gave her faith that God was in control of the situation. As long as she made herself available and committed her entire self, uh, as long as she committed her entire self to him, God was going to work everything out for his glory and according to his sovereign plan. So as a last review, the world is chaotic. The world is messy. There's no doubt about that. Though we may not see what God's plan is at this moment, we must have faith in his sovereignty and providence. And we must be willing to be partners of action with God. So as we end today, I'm going to show a short video clip uh, from Francis Chan. It's pretty old, a little bit blurry, uh, but I think you probably have seen it at one point or another. It's from 2006. But it's a good challenge for all of us. So let's hope it works. off the team, whatever, you know, just, there's so much instability, so much that we don't understand, that, that we don't know. For me, growing up, it was, uh, a lot of you guys know, my mom died giving birth to me, and my dad remarried, then my stepmom died in a car accident when I was nine, then my dad got married again, then my dad died of cancer when I was 12, and so I'm in junior high, my mom's dead, my stepmom's dead, my dad's dead. The only close relatives I had were my, my aunt and uncle, George and Sandra. And then when I was in high school, they got in a fight, and my uncle George shot and killed my aunt, and then stuck the gun to his own head, killed himself. So I'm 16 years old, and this is life to me, going, man, what's next? Everything seems to be falling apart, and we get a little worried, we get a little scared. And this is what Christians do, you know, they try to serve God, but then things get a little rocky. And things get a little unstable. And so we go, okay, that was nuts. I don't, I don't want to live like that. Let me, uh, let me hold on. And this is your routine. This is what so many people do. They go, you know what? I'm not going to try anything crazy. I'm just going to sit here. And uh, I'm just going to hold on. And uh, this is what you look like. You just go, uh, 
this is what people do. You know what? I'm just going to have my nice little family. We're just going to, um, you know, we're just going to keep to ourselves. We're going to live in a gated community. I'm going to homeschool my kids, make them wear helmets everywhere. I'm going to, um, you know, I'm not going to let them outside because sun has bad rays. I'm going to, um, you know, just on and on and on. And you just live your life in the safety of, I don't want to do anything crazy for God. I just... I just want to, you know, go to church on Sundays and maybe give like 2% um, and uh, maybe serve, help the nursery because I feel guilty. And then you do this your whole life and then you, you go, your greatest prayer is like, God, you know what? I would love to die in my sleep and not even feel it and then just go up to heaven. And so th- you want to die like this, just in your sleep, ooh, right in the middle of a dream, good dream, the dream you're going to heaven and you don't even feel it and then suddenly you wake up you stand before the judge and you go. <laughs> now, if, uh, could you imagine, could you imagine watching the Olympics, you know? And some girl does that, just gets up there, starts straddling the thing, and then steps off and goes, What is the judge supposed to do on the card? You see, and to me, I go, man, that's the routine that so many Christians are headed for. That's the routine, the boring, I do nothing crazy because I don't want to fall. That's the routine that they're going to live, and then one day it's going to be a shock because they're going to step off that balance beam and realize they're standing before the judge. They're standing before the judge and you think he's going to look at that routine and go, wow, well done. Well done. You lived the safest life possible. You didn't slip. You didn't fall. See, that's not the life that God's called us to. That's where the majority will head. But I don't want to go where the majority goes. Thank you, Eric, for your, uh, your sermon and um, bringing the story of Esther to life and just uh, help remind us that God is in control. Join me now as we do the offering. Uh, as, as everyone knows, we can do it online if you're on Zoom with the links, or you can uh, use the actual old school uh, plate by the door if you would like. So thank you, Lord, for this, um, these funds, Lord, that we can give back to you. And uh, we pray that you will use these for your kingdom uh, and to spread uh, your word and just to uh, uh, just to bless these, these these this offering, Lord, and and uh, you use it as you see fit. Amen. Uh, just join me now as we uh, as we pray for our do our prayers of hope. Lord, thank you for this uh, this time we can pray together as a congregation. I want to lift up the uh, the Matthew Lou barbecue to you right now next week. It's uh, such an important event in our lives and uh, in the lives of the church, in the life of the church as well, as we have a chance to, to, uh, to remember Matthew and to, um, and to really spread the word and to bring our friends and family here and just uh, not just have fun, but also that we can glorify you, Lord, and, uh, and just uh, remember uh, Matthew and, and what he meant to us and, um, and how important he was and how he's with you now, Lord, but we still remember him here. And we miss him, and we thank you, Lord, that we have this opportunity next week. Uh, I pray that the weather will be good and that you'll bring the right people and that we'll just uh, have a really wonderful time to, uh, to, share, your, uh, to share your blessings with, with, with each other. And, uh, and again, I just pray that you will bless this event. I pray also for, uh, for, for, the, for the COVID situation. It, it, there's still many people suffering, um, many people we know, many people we don't know, but there's many people around us who are going through this, Lord. And uh, we pray that you keep them safe and healthy and help them through this, um, this difficult ordeal. And I pray that this, uh, this, uh, this, this illness, this plague, will, will eventually come to an end and subside, and we can fully return uh, back, to, uh, to, back to our lives of uh, uh, just, just a focus on you and, and not have to, um, to be so concerned about uh, this, uh, this disease, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that um, you provided the medicine, the vaccines that we could use to help... Uh, to stay safe, Lord. Join me now as we do the Lord's Prayer. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I'm going to ask the worship team to uh, come up and uh, perform the, the closing song. If you're able, please stand. Um, the song, I'll Come to the Altar, is um, a good song to talk about hope in the, in the times of hopelessness as um, um, at the altar, Father's arms open wide for us. So let's sing this.
please remain standing as we have the benediction. Thank you, worship team. Today's benediction comes from Ephesians 3, 20 to 21. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that, has work, that, is, that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in, G, and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.